Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a lot of material to uh, to cover here, so um, I'll just uh, just to get everybody up to speed. I'll give uh, a quick overview on ultra high frequency ultrasound and the Vivo uh, imaging system platform family, and then we'll jump right into the 3100 system software. So this is very exciting for us. The the Vivo 3100 system has been out for uh, around a year and a half now. And this is our second major release of software. So this release includes lots of great features, but the major thing that uh, we're really, really happy about and, and you know, uh, ecstatic to be able to debut this now is the uh, 4D imaging mode. And then along with the, uh, the 3100, we've also got our Vivo Lab workstation analysis platform, which uh, also has some forthcoming improvements in as well, uh, 3D reconstruction and uh, some uh, improvements to our Vivo VASC analysis platform. So again, just to get everybody up to speed, I wanted to uh, show this slide, which uh, is something we, we often use in our presentations to describe the, the major differences between the Fujifilm Visual Sonics implementation of ultra high frequency ultrasound versus the clinical implementation. So clinical ultrasound is typically in the range of um, three to 15 megahertz uh, with uh, lots of uh, depth of penetration able to uh, access and non-invasively image uh, major areas of the human body versus our implementation of ultrasound at these higher frequencies, we, we typically start at 15 megahertz and go all the way up to uh, the outer edges of the 80 megahertz uh, range. So this uh, gives us extremely high resolution, which is uh, at the sacrifice of depth of penetration, which is a great application for small animal imaging. And you can see the comparative images on the right side uh, in grayscale of a, a mouse fetus versus a human fetus. So why do this? Well, translational research, the, the concept of bench to bedside and back, taking a modality like ultrasound, which is uh, used in the clinic, has been used in the clinic now for going on 40 years, uh, and using that in mouse models of uh, human disease pathology and taking those data and moving back and forth, and, uh, trying ultimately to uh, treat and cure human disease. So this is the, uh, the Vivo preclinical imaging system family. We have a range of systems available from uh, our longstanding Vivo 2100 platform uh, all the way up to uh, the Vivo 3100 platform, which will be uh, the, the major focus uh, for this presentation. As I said, the 3100 has been out now for around a year and a half. It takes our existing uh, high frequency technology that's uh, tried and true and packages it into um, a touch screen based uh, fully customizable user platform, which is very flexible uh, and has uh, extremely high throughput uh, for imaging studies when compared to some of the older platforms and the more traditional uh, keyboard and uh, toggle and knob sort of based controls for the ultrasound system. So moving, uh, just changing gears a bit now to get into specifically talking about um, cardiac imaging, uh, there's been a, a quite an evolution over time, again, going back in the history of ultrasound with um, cardiac imaging, all the way from the early beginnings of uh, M-mode imaging, which is a, a one-dimensional uh, imaging uh, application, looking at a single line down through uh, tissue over time. Uh, with the ability to do measurements of things like wall thickness and, and chamber dimensions, but uh, M mode in that one dimensional application makes a lot of temporal and spatial assumptions. There's assumptions about the ratio of the thickness to the length of the heart, uh, and you really are only sampling in, in, in one line uh, over a short period of time. So following on to that, there's 2D imaging. Um, and we've got a nice example here of a, a long axis uh, left ventricle of the mouse's heart in 2D. And of course, the measurements um, and uh, calculations for function that are available in 2D are widely accepted uh, based on the American Society of Echocardiography and the European Societies of Echocardiography consensus papers on measurements of planar dimensions and, and calculations of function. Um, and it's, it's quite, again, quite widely accepted and quite powerful, and, and we have had the ability to do this on our systems for many times now. But there still are some spatial assumptions which are built into these, uh, these types of measurements. Um, so 
trying to get away from those spatial assumptions, there's a nice uh, transition into 3D imaging, which uh, has, again, been around for some time uh, on the clinical side, and we've had the ability to do gated and triggered um, 3D acquisitions of the heart or the pretty well any area of um, small animals in 3D for uh, a long time now. But these images are static. So you're making a temporal assumptions there by only looking at a, a static image. But now, with 4D, we have the ability to look at both the spatial and the temporal dimensions altogether, uh, not making any assumptions now. So we now have, with 4D, uh, this, this complete view of the heart um, in the X, Y, and Z dimensions in, in space, plus uh, the time dimension as well. So we've got another example here of um, what a typical 4D um, image would look like. Again, this is long axis view of uh, a mouse's heart. Uh, and you can see as we, we rotate and, and move around and look at the cube, this is a, a fantastic view now all the way through, uh, like a short axis view, a long axis view, all the way from the base um, up through to the apex, giving you uh, a view now of the dynamics uh, of motion through a representative cycle uh, in the heart. So uh, again, going back to that previous slide talking about the assumptions, really there are now no assumptions um, with this type of image. You have all of the, um, the entire chamber, um, and then you also have uh, the time cycle of, of one, uh, one cardiac cycle to, to look at for analysis. So. Just um, some information about just kind of uh, uh, explain how this is implemented. Um, the function is similar to blending, kind of kind of a blend uh, combination of some existing options that we have had for some time. We, I mentioned 3D uh, in some of the previous slides. We have had 3D mode. We've had um, e our EKV mode, which is a, a gated um, triggered average to acquisition that uh, gives really high temporal resolution of a single um, cardiac cycle in the heart. That was only in 2D before, so now combining that throughout that EKV with um, 3D and ECG triggering, we've now been able to add high temporal, take the high temporal resolution of EKV and add it to the high spatial resolution of 3D. So again, thinking about that image in that previous slide that uh, we had there where you could see the, the motion dynamics of the entire chamber in all three dimensions throughout one representative cycle. And that image itself is a fairly is able to be acquired fairly quickly, the, that, that standard sort of quote unquote standard long axis view of a standard mouse's heart uh, takes between two, maybe a maximum of four minutes to acquire. Um, and just for context, um, the 4D mode, this 4D mode implementation is only available on the Vivo 3100 system and only with um, the uh, latest software uh, update, which we have just released. So um, kind of a visual representation here now of how these images are acquired and stacked together. So we've, uh, we have a, a B mode, it's a basic B mode, um, sort of a, a high view here at the base of the heart of the atria and the ventricles. And for the, almost the entirety of the time that our systems have been around, we've always had good quality physio, ECG and respiration being pulled in from the, the animals being monitored uh, as, they're, as they're being imaged. And that's allowed us to um, play some interesting uh, games with um, gating to respiration, which you see in gold bars here, and triggering to ECG, which are, are the two red lines, um, the, the two triggers where the ECG points were being picked up. So doing that, is, as again, has allowed us to, to, to develop EKV, this EKV mode, which we've had for, for some time, um, taking that, uh, that 2D image, gating and triggering based on the, uh, the, the physiology data and coming up with a, a loop of one averaged cardiac cycle. So we've now taken that EKV and blended it with our existing 3D using the, the, the hardware, using the 3D stepper motor that connects to our animal handling system, which moves the transducer through um, X, Y, and Z dimensions to give you a, a cube, which is created by acquiring images as, the, as the, the transducer steps through space driven by the motor collecting slices and then stacking those slices together into a cube. But again, that cube has always been a, a static cube. So now taking uh, the EKV mode that we uh, sh that I showed there on the previous slide, that 
that averaged um, that cycle uh, mode and then putting that together with 3D, essentially you can think of it now as taking an EKV at every step of the motor and then averaging, mixing those images all together to give a, a 3D cube that also has a time component to it now to show off one representative cardiac cycle, which we've got here. So I'm going to pass um, over to Christina to give a little bit of commentary about what she's um, seen in the field uh, and as she's been uh, working here developing uh, this uh, mode for us and doing some imaging. Great. Thank you, Stephen, and hello, everyone. I'm so happy to participate in this webinar today and talk about this awesome new imaging mode that we have uh, that is 4D. So as, as Stephen alluded to, 4D really makes no assumptions geometrically or temporally. And what we know about the heart is that the motion of the heart is not simply a two-dimensional in and out motion. In fact, it resembles more ringing of a mop. So there's this twist or torsion rotation that happens due to the spiral uh, rotate orientation of the muscle fibers within the heart. This multiplanar type of motion can easily be visualized in four dimensions, uh, which is something that you can't really see as much in two dimensions. So we can see as we stepped through that 4D image, when we were towards the apex, we had this rotation that resembled more of a counterclockwise rotation. As we stepped through that short axis on the right-hand side here, you see that towards the base of the heart, towards the aortic root, there's actually twisting that happens the opposite way. So that really represents that ringing mop motion uh, that many researchers are interested in. Now it's excellent and really interesting to look at these healthy, 4D, healthy hearts in 4D, but I think the true value of this feature comes when you're actually looking at disease models. So I had an excellent opportunity to go visit some of our uh, customers who are cardiovascular researchers and do some 4D imaging in some of their disease models. And the first one I'll share with you is a transverse aortic constriction model, or TAC model. For those who are not completely familiar with this model, it essentially involves uh, banding the transverse aorta, which is a component of the aortic arch. This banding then causes high pressure in the left ventricle and leads to left ventricular hypertrophy or thickening of the left ventricular wall. Now you can see on the bottom left here, we have a 4D image of an aortic arch. When we're looking at it, we can actually see that banding happen right at the aorta. But what's even more interesting is when we look at the left ventricle on the right-hand side here, what we see is thickened walls of the left ventricle in long axis. When we move over and scroll through a short axis view, you can really appreciate the thickness of the walls in short axis as well. What you'll also notice is although the walls are thickened, the heart's movement is still very dynamic. And that's something that's uh, going to be a bit different in this next model that I'll be showing you. So I also had the opportunity to look at a myo in myocardial infarct model where an occlusion was done in the left anterior descending coronary artery that caused an infarct, um, and then the mouse was uh, woken up and some imaging was done. So what we can see in this infarct model, and you can really appreciate both in uh, short axis and long axis, is that there is uh, the, oops, the wall motion is static towards the apex. Sorry about this, the movie's just being uncooperative. Um, you'll see there that this, the, there's static motion at the apex towards here, but towards the base, the motion of the heart's very dynamic. Uh, and that's very characteristic of an infarcted heart. What you'd have also noticed in that long axis view is that the apex was quite rounded. And again, that's something that's very typical for an infarcted heart. So you'll see right there the, the roundness of the apex compared to the healthy heart Stephen showed earlier and even that TAC model in the last slide. So I think these very clearly illustrate the impact that 4D research has and why it's important not to make assumptions on the shape of the heart or the dynamics of the heart. So now that I've really gotten your heart pumping about the types of uh, 
data you can obtain or the, the things that 4D can do for your research models, I'm going to pass things back over to Stephen so he can answer a question which I'm sure many of you are thinking, which is uh, what, can, what kind of data can we really obtain from these beautiful images? Great. Thanks, Christina. I think it's, it's really fair to say, I mean, if you, if you watch these images cycle through, you can really appreciate uh, in 2D, in this long axis view, I mean, as Christina said, you can really see the, the stillness of the apex versus the hyperkinetic motion at the base. But as you move around, and it's, it's amazing to see the different parts that are moving the, the interventricular septum uh, motion as it's compared to the anterior and posterior wall. I mean, the, the, the dynamics that are going on there is incredible. And I think those are things that we really never were able to appreciate before in, in, in two-dimensional and static three-dimensional imaging. So the measurements uh, and quantitation that you can, you can do right now uh, with, with the application, uh, you've got the ability to do some protocol-based measurements in the 2D state. Uh, an example here would be, say, our existing LV trace um, acquisition. Um, that, uh, or LV trace measurement, sorry, I should say, um, that gives you uh, all the cardiac functional parameters or another example would be the string method. I think there's a lot of power to be had in, in qualitative and semi-quantitative um, uh, assessments uh, of, of the heart sound in 4D. And, and I guess something you could, you could make an analogy here is um, the scoring methodologies that are used in histology and immunohistochemistry um, where you're assessing um, the motion that you're able to visualize based on the comparison to a normal animal or a control group animal uh, and looking at the uh, expected morphology and pathology. Um, certainly, uh, on the Vivo Lab workstation, you've got the ability to, in a reconstructed state, do volumetric analysis. So you can look at an analysis of volumes across all points in the cardiac cycle uh, and get an assessment of um, change in volume over change in time. And then certainly, as an example, is down here in the lower right, uh, a measurement on uh, individual frames, such as uh, this example here, uh, an area measurement in the left atria. Uh, yeah, just in that reconstructed state. Now, we are um, considering or working with some of our key customers on what some of the future analysis tools um, would be, and we're really eager to uh, get this uh, 40 data acquisition out there, get it in the hands of some users, and then see what sort of feedback um, we can get from there, uh, from our users, and really try to develop um, more measurements, more tools that will really help you uh, in, in your research. And just as an example um, of the volumetrics that, are, that you're able to do now, this is a nice example actually that Christina did here um, in, in with some of the data that we have captured here, looking at uh, full analysis of the volume uh, in a, a captured image over time. And so you can see that as the, as the heart cycles, uh, you can see the, the volume that's uh, been traced on top of it in reconstruction. Uh, changing over time, and you're able to certainly pull those numbers out and do uh, do any kind of analysis uh, on it from there. So I think uh, a major point of um, of interest certainly. We've mentioned the, the rapid acquisition, but uh, we've got a, a, a video here that we shot in, in the lab here in the office just to give a little bit of um, context uh, and show uh, how quick the acquisition of um, these types of data actually are. You can see uh, by the caption that's there that this is actually real time. Um, there was a little bit of setup that was done there in the beginning just to turn on uh, respiration gating and to select the acquisition parameters. There are a couple of different um, settings that you can do, things like um, presentation quality or just sort of a, a quick scan of basic quality. So you set that up ahead of time. Um, out of the frame here, this is a, a normal mouse, normal C57 um, Black 6 mouse that's being scanned here uh, on, our, on our animal handling system uh, down under uh, typical isoflurane anesthesia. So once the scan is started, again, the, uh, this, the system drives a 3D motor. That 3D motor steps through um, space, captures at each step a uh, whole cardiac cycle, a whole set of data, uh, including the image data and the, um, the physiology data. And then that, those data that are captured are then processed. And at the end, you get back a nice clip uh, where you've got not only all of the 
spatial components, but you've got all of the temporal components together. And then on the system itself, as you can see happening here live right now, that, that data set that was just captured is able to be loaded directly into 4D reconstruction. You can step through the cube uh, in space, and you can also play the cycle back as well. So and while it's cycling through, you can kind of move around again in space and, and get a, a real appreciation of all of the motion dynamics that are happening there uh, through that cycle. And then, of course, the next step would be to, to take um, this data set uh, off, uh, go to the Vivo Lab Analysis Workstation, and really dig deep into the data and do some more uh, in-depth analysis and, uh, and move on from there. So just... Uh, Changing gears a little bit and moving on to some of the other new features. Now, I did mention uh, off the top, um, this 4D uh, is a part of the second major software release for the 3100 platform, but there are some other great features um, in, that are in, um, value-added features, I should say, that are in this new release. One of the neat features that we've developed is uh, what we're calling Vivo Voice. It's a voice command system to actually control um, the system. Some example commands would be things like scan and free, safe clip, um, switch to B mode. There is a little bit of um, training adaptation time required for the system to sort of recognize the patterns of your voice, but it is uh, quite efficient, at, uh, especially if you're doing any um, hand scanning where you're, you're manually manipulating a, an animal, say for a difficult scan, and, and, and you have the transducer in, in the other hand. It really does help um, speed up your throughput and give you a little bit of flexibility so that you could quickly uh, save uh, images that look great or switch to different modes and, and uh, while well, you've got your hands busy. Um, another neat feature that we've, we've built in, and uh, again, this is a, a value-add feature that's just there as part of the new release, is something that we're calling background data transfer. Um, we recognized fairly early on with the 3100 that while the touch screen is amazing for throughput and for customizability, it's a bit challenging to do really accurate and reproducible measurements on a touch screen. So there was a step required where you had to take your data off of the system and go to the Vivo Lab workstation. Well, now with background data transfer, uh, before you start imaging, you can set up a target location, say a USB drive or even a network drive, and while you're working on the system acquiring images in the background, those data can be transferred immediately uh, out to that location so that you've got very rapid access to that data. So you can imagine working through a study, say imaging 10 or 15 animals, finish up, um, Put the put the uh, you know clean up, shut shut the system down, go back up to your office and uh, turn on your Vivo Lab workstation computer, and the data are already there in your working target location, ready for you to start analyzing. So um, we're always looking for ways to try and speed up throughput, and and we. Uh, hit on this idea of uh, trying to get the data out of the system automatically. Another uh, little addition that we uh, we put in the system as well is um, an extension of the existing 3D triggering option, which was only, it was always separated before, one trigger image for uh, a systolic um, state and one trigger image for a diastolic state. You can actually do that uh, together now in the same image. So it actually, if you're doing uh, uh, static 3D of the heart or, um, say, 3Ds of uh, vessels or things like that, you actually can have now the number of acquisitions that you uh, would have to do to get the data that you need by uh, using the, the dual triggering uh, option. So, again, the, the 3100 is a, a complete, if you've never experienced it, it is a completely touch screen based um, system. So all of the buttons that you see there on the system are all customizable. The locations can be moved around um, within some, some, some limitations. Um, you can show and hide various buttons that you uh, might use for certain functions. So looking at the 3100 system, and, and it's been out there for a while and getting some user feedback, we made a few changes to some of the the buttons have uh, collapsed um, certain things together. Um, we've added some extra controls, changed sort of the way some of the menus um, behave. You can see an example here on the screen of the, the 3D and 4D um, setup menus. Um, the, the way that they, they sort of roll out or fold back in uh, is, is much um, smoother and more consistent across different parts of the application than it was before. 
Um, so there, there's a, a, a variety, a huge variety, I should say, of uh, refinements that we've made to the controls, really to try and improve the user experience um, based on feedback that we were getting from the field, try to make things a little easier for users, try to make things um, faster and more efficient. Um, that's another big change. Uh, in this release is our Vivo HD image processing methodology. Uh, it debuted with the initial release of the 3100 and we've, we've gone back and looked at the speckle reduction algorithm that we were using. We've refined it, we've improved it uh, substantially, and we've also added selectively uh, spatial compounding into Vivo HD as well. So the, uh, from what I've seen and what uh, we've had some feedback from sort of early demonstrations, the image quality is, uh, is significantly improved. Uh, the image quality with Vivo HD was, was quite a, a leap on the initial release, and we've made a, a, a very significant leap again in image quality. Uh, the images now are, are, are even better than they've ever been before. Um, and some other, a uh, number of other improvements as well, uh, sort of hardware related improvements on the system, um, things like some increases in sensitivity and um, things like hardware based frame caching that really speed up, uh, again, the throughput and make the system more uh, responsive and more uh, active than it, uh, more reactive, I should say, than it was before. So. Along with the 3100 um, system software, we uh, are getting ready to release an update to our Vivo Lab analysis workstation. So if, uh, just for some, some context again, the Vivo Lab is, uh, is the kind of the central nexus for data from all of our imaging um, platforms. Uh, you're, you're able to send data into Vivo Lab from the 2100, the 1100, the 3100. Uh, it contains all of our protocol-based measurements and also some third-party uh, image analysis uh, uh, pieces of software, things like our Vivo strain for uh, myocardial strain analysis, Vivo VASC for looking at vessel wall motion, and Vivo CQ for looking at um, perfusion kinetics in um, nonlinear contrast. So various components of um, Vivo Lab are, are being updated um, for this release. One major area of update is um, in the 3D, 4D reconstruction. When we, we started working on 4D, we realized that we needed to do a little bit of work on what we had for um, 3D and 4D reconstruction. So um, we've, we've substantially improved what was there before with a, a sort of a, a, a thumbnail uh, view, uh, what we would call a multi-slice view, to be able to navigate through um, 3D uh, uh, data that you have very quickly, and uh, also a, a completely different uh, method for uh, tracing volumes on 3D. So it's kind of hard to, 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 to describe this or show this just in a static image in PowerPoint. So I'm actually going to jump out very quickly to um, a current Vivo lab. Uh, I've got a, a 3D um, kidney uh, acquisition here that uh, was respiration gated. So I'm just going to, to bring that up and uh, you know we can uh, navigate through the cube here so we can see a, a quite a good image of the, the kidney showing the renal artery and the renal vein there. Um, if we go now to do analysis on this, we are starting off uh, as a default now with this multi-volume, uh, multi it's multi-volume, multi-slice view. And the tracing for doing 3D volumetrics on this works substantially differently from what we had before now. Um, with just a few clicks, just a few placements of some contours, the software will actually connect the different contours together and very quickly give us our 3D volume. I'm just going to switch over to the surface view. So you can see we've got a completed 3D volume there in probably a tenth or less of the time um, that it would have taken to do the the old methodology, which was um, navigating through the cube slice by slice and tracing contours, tracing contours, tracing contours all manually, and, uh, and then closing to connect all those manually traced contours together. We now have um, on this, this multi-slice view, there's a, a few of the um, contours that you can see that have control handles on them. Those are the ones that I dropped uh, manually 
by manual tracing, and then some of the others that uh, don't have the control handles on them are ones that software has interpolated um, between uh, between those ones that I've manually dropped. So, and now we can go back uh, if we if we see where the the, the, the morphing, if the interpolation has gone, gone a little bit off the rails, we can adjust that and the entire um, volume will, will morph and reshape itself in time. So it's substantially faster um, than it used to be. Uh, and again, this is going to be part of um, the next forthcoming Vivo Lab release. You'll be able to use this tool to assess not only uh, newly acquired 3D and 4D data from the 3100, but also pre-existing, any pre-existing uh, 3D data that you have uh, for, say, a 2100 or an 1100. Um, it, within VivoLab, again, VivoLab ser um, serving as a nexus, a central analysis and data management point for all of the data, um, these changes in 3D, you'll be able to use those on, on old data, even 2100, uh, Vivo 2100 data that's, that's many years old from older studies, you could certainly go back and reanalyze it um, using this new 3D methodology. Um, so that's um, one big change um, coming in Vivo Lab. Uh, another big change um, coming in Vivo Lab is um, a redeveloped version of the Vivo VASC uh, vessel wall analysis package that I mentioned. In the um, most recent release of Vivo Lab, the one that's out there now that we released um, last year, we debuted um, an updated Vivo Strain package. And we've gone back now and um, done some similar work on the Vivo VASC vessel analysis package now. So. Um, lots of um, small improvements, some large improvements. Um, the addition here of one thing on the, on the screen in the upper right is the, 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 the derivation of radial strain, which was never there before. Um, some of the workflow has been improved um, and uh, lots of nice little changes to help out. So again, this will be available with the next release of Vivo Lab, and uh, anybody, uh, any customers out there who do already have Vivo VASC, if you update to the new uh, Vivo Lab when it becomes available, your uh, Vivo VASC uh, in install will be updated as well, and you'll be able to access um, and work with some of these new changes. And your old data will still be able to be uh, to be reviewed and looked at. So just to, to wrap up, um, we've, we've talked a lot about 4D, um, and I hope uh, everybody's very excited uh, about all of the rich dynamic data sets that you can get from 4D um, and, uh, and the really rapid, easy acquisition for 4D. Again, it is a, quite a, an easy um, method to use, an easy application to use, and the data acquisition is quite fast considering the richness of the data set that does uh, come from it. Um, we've got lots of new features available in uh, this forthcoming software release for existing Vivo 3100 customers. When the uh, uh, software release uh, is going to be posted on our website for download uh, very shortly, we're just kind of finishing off on a few last minute um, documents um, before we, uh, we post it on the website for download. So I do encourage existing 3100 users to go ahead download um, the update when it becomes available and apply it to uh, your system. Uh, make sure you read the release notes and, uh, and learn about all the great changes that are there. Um, and then uh, certainly that, that uh, update will permit uh, access to uh, 4D. 4D uh, mode is a purchasable option in this new, uh, in this new release. And then uh, shortly after um, the 3100 system software is released, we've got the Vivo Lab update coming uh, again as well with uh, some of that great new uh, 3D and 4D reconstruction and analysis tools that I showed along with the uh, updated Vivo VASC. So um, thanks everyone for taking the time to, uh, to attend and, um, and hopefully enjoying the great images that we were able to show. And uh, we're open for questions. Um, if uh, anybody uh, has some, please, uh, Let's uh, send them on in via the chat window, and we'll uh, try to answer them. Thanks, Stephen. That was great. Um, we do have one question. Uh, question is, it seems the acquisition is triggered. What if you don't have ECG signals, or those are difficult to acquire? So that is one caveat for 4D. Um, because the acquisition is triggered and gated, you do need to have um, ECG and respiration both. Um, you can do it just with ECG triggering, but it, it's, um, the data quality is not as good. So we do uh, encourage both respiration gating and ECG triggering. Now, there's a number of different ways of doing that. 
um, using the animal handling system. One would be um, affixing the, the subject animal to the animal handling table, as we've always had. We do also have um, a, a box, an e-box option with uh, needle electrodes or disc electrodes um, to permit more uh, free movement of um, the subject animal while still acquiring that physiology data. But yes, uh, if, if you don't have a physiology data stream um, for the system to, to, to look at and to uh, use the, that, that triggering and gating to reconstruct the image, then yeah, uh, 4D is, is, uh, is, going to be is going to require that definitely. Okay, thank you. Another question we have, has anybody tried different approaches for 3D, 4D cardiac data acquisition, such as the combination of the fan scanning motor and the left parasternal long axis view. That way more cardiac structures could be covered from a limited acoustical window with even better image quality. So we have just sort of discussed and, and, and researched internally a little bit. Um, uh, I think by fan scanning, uh, the customer prob probably means um, what is referred to sometimes in the clinical side as a wobbler, um, where the, the, the linear array um, m moves back and forth um, in space and, and gives a, a sweep. We've kind of looked at that, um, but the uh, implementation that we have now with the 3D stepper motor uh, does seem to, to work quite well. I think um, down the road in the future, um, I think having this implementation now, we are going to start doing more research on the hardware side. Um, if, if anything, I would be really interested to see something like a Matrix Pro. I mean, that's, that's really the, the ultimate end goal. Um, but for now, I think the implementation will stay with the stepper motor. Uh, there are some um, users and customers of ours out there who have uh, done some of their own implementations of 4D. Um, for those of you who are sort of regular attendees of our webinars, or if you uh, look on our YouTube channel and go back to a webinar that was done uh, last year, I believe it was November-ish last year, um, uh, it was uh, presented by um, Craig Gurgin and one of his um, PhD students, Arvind Sorpinata, from uh, Purdue um, University. And they have um, had a Vivo 2100 for some time, uh, and through um, some uh, remote control and some MATLAB scripting and um, taking the raw RF data, they've had developed their own implementation of, of 4D, which they're, actually theirs, uh, their implementation of 4D, uh, their sort of homebrew implementation was really um, one of the major uh, uh, inspirations that we took to, to really finally go ahead and do this. 4D is something that uh, customers have been asking us about for years and years and years, and we didn't really have a good methodology for doing it and didn't really have um, the processing capability to handle the data. But seeing some of the implementations that were out there and seeing the ways that, um, that the other users, such as, uh, as Craig and Arvin, had gotten it to work, uh, kind of gave us the inspiration to go ahead and, uh, and try it out. So, there are de so, so in, in short, in summary, there are definitely some other implementations that we can look at and we are considering. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Another question, can 4D imaging be used in areas other than the left ventricle? Yeah, certainly. Um, the, as long as you have um, ECG and respiration signal that you can gate and trigger off of, um, you can look at any area of the body. In fact, in, in that webinar that I mentioned that, um, that Craig Gurgin and Arvind Sopranata gave for us, uh, they showed some abdominal uh, aortic aneurysms in 4D, which uh, were absolutely beautiful images. Um, we've done some aortic arch imaging. Um, I think I might actually have an atrial view here, yes I do, um, uh, looking, we, we did some work just fairly recently here looking uh, in the lab here, looking at um, the atria and trying to see if we could get a good view of, um, in this case, the left atria, which is sort of down here in the, in the lower right, and you might see that measurement flashing there. That This is the image that I used to show that 2D uh, area measurement on the atria. We've also gotten some great images of um, the aortic arch as well, uh, which uh, looks fantastic. Uh, normally, uh, in, it's in a normal animal where you can really see the, the blood uh, speckle rushing through it. And if you remember back to um, the transaortic, transverse aortic constriction 
images that um, Christina talked about, you could really see there um, the, 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 the tack uh, that, that aortic constriction was very evident in that 4D of that aortic arch along with the, the blood pool moving through as well. So, so yeah, really, really any area, I mean, the, the biggest application definitely we think for 4D is going to be in, in cardiac function, but certainly uh, any area um, of the body uh, will be able to be imaged with it. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, someone's asking uh, if you could explain what spatial compounding is. So um, spatial compounding, I mentioned that that is in this uh, software release is something that was added to the uh, existing speckle reduction algorithm. So spatial compounding uh, is uh, it's an interesting little trick that you can play with electronics. When you have a, a linear array transducer, you can change the, the timing of how the, uh, the array is, is fired and how the data are collected. So you can actually change the, the angle, what's called the insonation angle. And uh, instead of all of the, the elements firing straight down and then receiving straight back, you can change the timing and, and fire the, the, the beam out at angles. So you take uh, maybe one, one or two different uh, insonation angles, receive that data back, and then overlay it together. And uh, it, it reduces the, um, the speckle and the noise in the image um, because you've got, um, again, because of the angle, you get a, a variety of, um, of speckle patterns and signal types coming back from tissues from different angles. So by taking those, uh, those angled images and then laying them together and averaging them out, you're actually, we're actually able to reduce um, noise and give a cleaner image. Um, both spatial compounding and speckle reduction are, are fairly well-known um, applications in, in ultrasound. They've been used clinically, uh, again, for many, many years. But um, for us on the preclinical ultra-high frequency side, um, it took some time for us to really research how to do um, the speckle reduction and the spatial compounding at uh, at the high frequencies. Uh, so uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And another question here: What advantages does 4D have over strain as well as 3D? So I think um, 4D has a huge advantage. I think over 3D, if we think back to um, that uh, that evolution of cardiac imaging slide. Uh, and the couple of slides that I showed um, where we, we were showing kind of giving context for how we developed 4D. Um, the 3D that we, have, that we have been able to get with the system uh, for some time now, it, again, is static. Um, so you've got the, the spatial uh, components, the X, Y, and Z um, dimensions, but only at one point, only at systole or only at diastole or only at a certain time point in between. So 4D really adds that, that temporal component to the spatial um, the components that you have, giving you a, a full a view of the full cycle in, 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 all, uh, in all three uh, dimensions and then the fourth dimension being time. Um, the, uh, the advantage of restrain, uh, again, is that uh, although vivo strain analysis is a very powerful analysis package and it gives you uh, really amazing deep data on, on what's going on um, you know, on, the, on the endocardial border, the epicardial border through the myocardium, it is still two-dimensional, either in the long axis or the short axis. So I, I think there's actually a case to be made to look at both um, two-dimensional strain and 4D data sets together to really assess the motion dynamics um, spatially, but then also look at uh, the, the, the strain and the strain rate uh, in those in, in two dimensions, uh, in, in the different uh, long axis and short axis views, and really you know, put all those all those different types of data together to really generate a, a really large, rich data set of what's going on in the animal models. Okay, thank you so much, Stephen and Christina. It's been a wonderful presentation. And for those wanting more information on uh, the new updates for Vivo 3100 or more information on 4D, uh, please do visit our website, www.visualsonics.com. And if you have any other questions or if you have any feedback on this presentation, we do encourage you to contact us through our website. And also engage with us on our social media links and check back uh, on our webinar page uh, for what's coming up for next month's webinar. 
Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and we hope you enjoyed this presentation. We will be sharing this recording with everyone that registered. So until next time from all of us here at Fuji Film Visual Sonics, happy imaging.